And so if a surrounding pi disappears, or if that original pi disappears, then the ability for that area to have toads is gone. And so you can, but just the interaction between one ply and another ply in terms of animal movement, plant movement, and things of that nature is, is impacted. You have to realize that the effect of these functions, um, what, whether it's biodiversity, carbon sequestration, aquifer recharge, is, is not on an individual ply of basis. It's on the economy of scale of all the plies together. And so if one ply can't, can't fill up with water, and provide the habitats and, and the functions and the recharge, then that affects this other ply as well. Because that water uh, can go here and cause uh, dramatic um, interruptions in terms of the entire function, in terms of the cycle of the, of the playa, or it can just go somewhere else and disappear. And so what, what, what's important is, is the cumulative effects of all the playas working together providing these functions, not the, not the impacts of, of individual plies affecting those functions. Is there a Playa Protection Act, or will there ever be a Playa Protection type policy? Currently, no. We hope to have, we're working on some stuff right now that might, that might provide some options for Playa Protection, additional options for Playa Protection in the future. Currently, the only uh, um, option available for private landowners is working through NRCS and USDA through their programs and through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, and um, some of the playas that are closer to the refuges, Buffalo Lake and Milshu, um, you know, we, we've done some work on, on those as well. But in terms of widespread landscape level protection, not at this time. Are you going to have me keep going down? What's that? We're now really trying to push more fire onto the landscape. We know the effects of it. We know how to handle it. We, we feel like it's the right thing to do. Some of the pioneers, Arthur Hartman, Harold Weaver, Henry Wright, were pioneers of fire in Texas. Uh, I, I had the pleasure to work underneath Henry Wright, who was a professor here at Texas Tech. And uh, I, I, can't, I can't even recount the number of times he scared me. But fire is an inherently dangerous thing, and you know that's part of it is the risk. But it's 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 a worthy risk for our landscapes. Wright and Bailey wrote a book on fire ecology, and uh, in there there's a description that says to the pioneers that prescribed fire, whose foresight was not swayed by ridicule, these guys got beat up politically for for pushing fire. They, you know, they were ostracized, saying, you know, you guys are just a bunch of pyromaniacs or whack jobs, you know, whatever. But they, they stood their ground, and they said, no, this is right, this is right. We've got the research, we've got the data, this is right. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. But here's, here's the key thing. They, they did say, burn wisely and safely, and do not destroy what has taken years to develop and maintain. And that's something that, that I guess, as, as fire ecologists, we always, we always try to say that. It's, Whatever we do, we don't want to go backwards. If we make a mistake, it's going to set us back. So we're always trying to burn wisely and safely. Okay, so we're in 2010 now. And this It's really not the past two decades. It's probably the past three decades. We're, we're rediscovering the fire and the benefits that it does. Um, some of the reasons, I, I think it's a vote thing. Of, of, you know, when, we, when I first started in fire in, in 86, 87, that wasn't the new thing. It's kind of like video games, you know. Oh, we got this new one now. It's, we have this new tool. It's fire. Fire's cool. We're going to do it. You know, blah, blah, blah. 
Then it went away and we went into a chemical thing and then it came back a little bit and it went away and, you know, the track hoed rubber showed up to get rid of brush. And so there's always this new thing, but this, this fire always keeps coming back, always keeps coming back to the, the forefront of, of range management, brush control, uh, restoration work. Fire always keeps coming back. It's, it's a cycle. So we're, we're, we're kind of back in this, this cycle again of fire is the, is the new vogue again. Why do we burn? Why do we burn? Why do we go out and intentionally set stuff on fire? To manage brush is one of the reasons. And, and I would argue that right now every brush species we have in the rolling plains and the southern high plains are sprouter species. But remember that slide I showed you earlier about frequency. Frequency is important on managing brush. We have a lot of species that do not like brush in, in the southern high plains. One of them is a big species called the lesser prairie chicken. We maintain brush species with repeated fires. We keep that brush level low. Birds can inhabit that habitat type. Use fire to clean up after improvements. And we, we do that on this refuge. We do it on private lands around here. We go in there and we do a mechanical treatment, we do a chemical treatment, we do a grazing treatment, and we use fire to clean up afterwards, to get rid of the woody debris that's, that, that we've put onto that landscape. Grazing, there's, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of documents on the, the use of fire to improve grazing. It, it makes the grass more palatable, it makes it more nutritious, it makes it easier to digest. So we do that. And wildlife habitat. Fires uh, used to create wildlife habitat is not just this scorched earth policy. There's always pockets of unburned areas. You know, depending on the objective of the fires and, and how we apply them, we, we can mimic or modify whatever we need to do for wildlife habitat. 